Well, we're in the book of Daniel, and we're going to talk about Nebuchadnezzar's affidavit. You'll discover when you study uh, chapter 4, it is an affidavit by a Gentile king. He writes chapter 4. It's the longest chapter in the book of Daniel. And so uh, that's where we are. Um, just to refresh your memory, Daniel's divided in two halves. There's six chapters in the front that are historical. They're narratives, story-like. And uh, the last six are visions. And we'll deal with those, of course, when we get there. But chapter one, Daniel's a teenager deported uh, into the, uh, when Babylon took over uh, uh, Israel. And he's deported as a teenager. He's one of the promising young men of royal, or, of royal lineage. And he and his three buddies are the focus of the whole book. But they were uh, taken to be in the graduate school to serve at court before the king. Very promising young men. And that, the, that first chapter is very important. You get a feeling of the character of these interesting guys. But this young king, Nebuchadnezzar, who was general and succeeded in making the Babylonian presence the dominant factor in that region, especially by defeating Pharaoh Necho at Battle of Karshemesh, lays siege to Jerusalem, but also discovers his father's died. He's now king of Babylon, not only the leading general, but he's now the king. He heads home after putting up a vassal king and taking Daniel and his three friends and some others hostage. When he's at home, uh, he has a strange, disturbing dream, which he uses as an opportunity to find out if his staff has any real skill or not. So he pretends to have forgotten it. The scholars have different views, but that, 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 that's one view we defend from the scripture, by the way. But in any case, um, and of course, his, his advisors, five different categories of his advisors, can't help him. But Daniel, who, and he gives the order to have them all killed, Daniel, who is in that job description, is ordered to be killed. Goes to a supervisor and says, hey, why so hasty? Give us a crack at it. And so he and his three friends have a prayer meeting that night. God reveals to Daniel. Uh, see, the, the gimmick was not just to interpret the dream. What was the dream? And then he'll interpret it. So uh, the, the, uh, Daniel chapter 2 is one of these great chapters where, they, where he grandstands this in the way it should be grandstanded. Um, and um, he describes to Nebuchadnezzar this strange dream, which, of course, was this metal image. And we've been through all that. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar is profoundly impressed because it as he mentions it, he realizes this was the dream he had, and uh, he also interprets it and so forth. Because of that, Nebuchadnezzar promotes Daniel and his three buddies to key positions. In fact, surprisingly key positions. And we'll talk about that when we get in chapter 4. But uh, you, one thing you need to understand that usually isn't brought out is the guys that were to be executed had their life saved because Daniel interpreted the dream. On the one hand, you'd think they'd be grateful, but if you understand human nature, they're just resentful because they were upstaged. So they set the stage for chapter 3, where, of course, Nebuchadnezzar is fanned into an ego trip in which he builds this huge image and, uh, and uh, forces its worship. And, of course, the three friends um, of Daniel will not bow before this, and so the whole thing was a, an entrapment situation by these rivals. And so they get thrown in the fiery furnace, and you know the story. Uh, Jesus joins them in that fiery furnace, and uh, so that's what was last time. So now, his, this is still some time later, maybe 10, 20 years gone by, but uh, Nebuchadnezzar is still on an ego trip, and uh, we're, he's going to get a lesson in pride in chapter 4. But I'll tell you right up front, what's interesting about the chapter isn't just the event, it's Nebuchadnezzar's description of the event. And it wasn't private, this is something he published throughout the world. So as you read chapter 4, as we go through that, realize the source of it. Now, after this, next time we'll talk about the fall of Babylon. And uh, we'll actually take two sessions for that. One for the, the historical part that Daniel talks about, and then we'll have a, 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 an appendix, so to speak, on the future of Babylon that is the most important city in Iraq, and there are things going on there that we want to talk about. And then, of course, chapter 6 is the famous incident of the lion's den. This is not Babylonian, it's Persian. By now we're in the Persian Empire. The Persians have conquered Babylon. And Daniel is risen to power in the Persian Empire. Fascinating story. And he has an unusual job that most people don't know about. And in fact, it, you won't understand the Christmas story about the Magi unless you understand what chapter 6 is really all about. So that'll be a fun chapter. But the reason I go through this, I want to remind you that chapters 2 through 7 are in Aramaic, not Hebrew, because these chapters deal with Gentiles. And it's a very unusual part of the scripture. And uh, six is, uh, chapter 7 is part of the last 
six chapters which are visions, but it also is focusing on the Gentile world, and it's interesting that chapters two through seven are written in the Gentile language of that day. But we're in chapter four. This is all by way of review and, and warm up, and for those that may not have been with us in the earlier sessions, let's just jump in. Back in chapter three, you may recall Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold whose height was three score, that is 60 cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And you may recall, we assume that it was similar to the image that he saw in his dream, except it was not multiple metal, metals, it was all gold, that was the representing, and it, it, all gold, and it was in, incredibly high. Why, one of the points that I made when we introduced the book, back uh, several sessions ago, that it's one of the most documented, most uh, uh, authenticated books in the Bible. There is more information in recent years that have confirmed the reality of Daniel's narratives and the fact that not only are they correct, but they obviously had involved an eyewitness. And so we'll touch on some of that, especially in this coming hour. But one of the things, in, there are cuneiform tablets in the British Museum that indicate in 596 BC there was a revolt that was put down within the kingdom. And there are some scholars that believe that may have set the stage for this wide-scale affirmation or reaffirmation involving the worship of the image and so forth in chapter 3 and swearing allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar was probably a reaction to that revolt. So that, and that would be about the right timing if that was 596 BC. In other words, roughly, um, uh, uh, if you figure uh, six, uh, 605, 606 was when he won. Uh, so you've got... Um, um, uh, uh, five or six plus four, so you got roughly a decade into this is when we had, uh, they had this up, uprising. So, uh, and you may recall, of course, that Daniel's three friends were given new names. Uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were renamed Babylonian names as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whose names you may not know what they mean, but they're familiar because, of course, of the famous uh, gospel song. And so, it's interesting that they did find a Babylonian clay prism, it's presently in the Istanbul Museum, that mentions three people that the names appear to be matching these three uh, guys. Uh, so, for what it's worth. We covered that last time. Well, let's get into chapter four. This is all intended as a way of warm up or review for what led up to chapter four. And uh, now Nebuchadnezzar obviously has been through uh, some interesting experience over the last decade or two. The, the not only taking over king, but the dream experience in chapter two, the, the, bur, the fiery furnace thing in chapter three. And so chapter four, we need to get, we're gonna get an insight into the man. He, in fact, he writes, he's gonna talk about a dream and his convalescence of a response to that dream. So chapter four, verse one, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people. Notice the style here. This is like a public declaration. Visualize the, his troops going and posting copies of this on trees throughout the kingdom, the known world at that time. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations and languages. Notice these are not just Babylonians. This is not a little local thing. Babylon had some fairly substantial reach. To all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good. Who thought it good? Nebuchadnezzar, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. This is a pagan king acknowledging that he's discovered the real living God. I think that's interesting. And you'll see the way it concludes. Uh, you'll understand why it is that I, at least, in my fancies, expect to meet him in heaven. That may surprise you. It won't, let me put it this way. I don't know if he will be, but it wouldn't surprise me if he's there for reasons that you'll see here in chapter 4 and some other things. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. Quite a statement. Especially when you realize the context, who's saying it, and to whom he's talking to a pagan world. How great are his signs, that is the high God, and how mighty are his wonders. This is Nebuchadnezzar talking. This isn't Daniel talking, although it obviously echoes instructions that Daniel had given him. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. In, con in, in contrast to the uh, um, uh, uh, image that was in chapter 2, that he was going to be succeeded by another, which of course the Persians, and then, then the Greeks, and then Romans, and so forth. 
His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. This is an admission. This is a perspective of Nebuchadnezzar that didn't come easily. And he's going to describe how he came to this awareness. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, there again, see, you understand who's saying all this. And this is in Aramaic, not Hebrew, by the way. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. This is a second dream. Don't confuse it with the dream in chapter 2. That was the introductory thing, the whole thing. Here's another one. I saw a dream which made me afraid. This isn't just a dream that troubled him. This somehow, this dream scared him. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Very similar to the situation in chapter 2. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. I find that surprising. I thought he would have learned his lesson in chapter 2. But apparently these guys are still in business, and they still have their you know, Psychology Today journals on their desks, and they have Sigmund Freud in their libraries, whatever. Anyway, therefore I made a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Now there is a whole group of job descriptions all through the book of Daniel. There's five basic nouns. And many commentaries go into great length to try to explain what each one of those means. But it turns out, if you go through all of that, they all overlap. When you, what you think of as a magician and what you think of as an astrologer is, or soothsayers, it fits all of them. It's not as if they were as distinct as some scholars like to make. They all overlap quite a bit. The word Chaldean is a multiple-use word. It can mean someone who lives in Chaldea. It can be used thus as a, as a nationalistic or an ethnological type of label. Here, it's being used as a principal attribute of that particular culture, which, of course, is occultic divination and that sort of thing. But anyway, these are the, this is the gang of advisors. They could not make known to me, unto me the interpretation that I have. That's Nebuchadnezzar's assessment. But at the last, Daniel came in before me. I think that's fascinating, because that wasn't his name. It was his real name. His name was Belteshazzar. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier when we first introduced that, Belteshazzar, don't confuse him with Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, who's going to be a ruler in chapter 5. They're two different words, very similar, but very different. Daniel was given a Babylonian name. But it's interesting to me that Nebuchadnezzar's preferential use is to use his Jewish name. At the last, Daniel came in before me. But since this is going throughout the world, and these people administratively know of Belteshazzar, whose name was Belteshazzar. Daniel was a very, very prominent guy. In fact, one of the things that came up last chapter, when you go through the whole fiery furnace episode, the thing that everybody misses and we have somebody looking at a Sunday school context, looking at the story, asking the question, Where's, where was Daniel? Daniel is conspicuous in his omission from chapter 3. And what obviously is going on in chapter 3 is these rivals, these, up, these guys that were upstage in chapter 2, have contrived, got the king on this ego trip, and contrived the situation knowing that these three Jewish young men wouldn't bow before that thing, and they, they set it up so that by not doing it, they'd be punished to death. That was their... The, the rival's revenge, if you want to call it that. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar is trapped into doing that. They, in fact, get thrown in the fire furnace, but they get miraculously preserved, much to everyone's astonishment. And uh, what's interesting in that whole story is, where's Daniel? You only have three choices. Daniel was there and, didn't, and, and chose to bow. Well, if you know everything about Daniel, you know that's not likely. Or Daniel was there and didn't bow, but wasn't accused by these guys. That's also not very likely. The third possibility is that Daniel, for some reason, wasn't around. He was probably on an errand for the king, some foreign, dignity, foreign mission somehow. In fact, it was Daniel's absence from the court that probably prompted these characters to promote this whole idea to nail, nail his three buddies. But in any case, uh, Daniel's, Daniel is a key subject of this edict of Nebuchadnezzar. That in itself is a fascinating uh, issue. 
And we're going to show you some documentation of some of this in chapter 4. It's, it happens that chapter 4 is one of these chapters that there's a lot of discoveries that have been made of quotes and other things in, in the ancient records. But anyway, but at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. See, Belshazzar was, was the one he worshipped. And in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying... Oh, Belteshazzar, master of the musicians. Oh, wait a minute. What is his title? Huh? What is Daniel's title? Here it is. Master of the magicians. Rab Khatum. It means chief of the magicians. Daniel was put in charge of all these advisors. He was just a young guy when they were all sentenced to death in chapter 2, but of course he, his, his, his impressive performance there before the king caused him to be put in charge of this staff group. He's the chief of staff, so to speak, of these advisors. Oh, and by the way, that's an important thing to do because when you get to chapter 6, an unnoticed little phrase in chapter 6 is that he's Rob Magi. He is put in charge of the hereditary priesthood of Persia. The priests in Persia were a very proud her, her inherited office. And Darius puts this Jew in charge. How did that go over? Not very impressed. They were impressed. That, that's what they contrived the lion's den thing in a very similar fashion to chapter 3's fiery furnace. We're getting ahead of the story. That's because there's a because there's a whole secret thing that Daniel did with the Magi that you want to understand or you won't understand the Christmas story. About Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Notice the word gods is in the plural. It is in the Hebrew too. Elohim is a plural noun. It's always used as a singular grammatically, but that's, again, in, even in the Aramaic translations, we, get, we pick up that trinity rumble in there. But anyway, let's move on. Verse 10. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. So in this particular, the, the previous dream he had the metal image and all this. In this dream, there's a huge tree in the middle of the earth, middle of the world. And the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. It's quite a tree. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was the meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. That's quite a tree. Obviously, this is a dream, so okay. And Nebuchadnezzar is describing this. I saw, he says, in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Wow. See, after this whole buildup, this tree was fabulous. It was big. It was robust. It provided everybody's needs. And it is being cut down. Branches cut off. Leaves sh uh, shaken off. Scattered, fruit scattered. And the beasts and fowls scattered. Disturbing. Nevertheless, the instruction continues from the watcher, the angels or whatever have come down. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven. And let his portion be with the beasts in, in the grass of the earth. And let his heart be changed from man's. And let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. You notice the shift in idiom here from the tree. It suddenly gets personal. See, leave the stump of his roots. So the tree isn't going to die. It's been cut down, but the roots are still there. It's still going to grow. Roots in the earth. Even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with dew of heaven, and let his portion 
See, again, you begin to infer from the very structure here that this tree represents a person. Let his portion be with the beasts of the, and the, in the grass of the earth. Let his heart, he must have a heart, let his heart be changed from man's, in other words, he apparently had a man's heart, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now, this term, times, may be familiar to you prophecy students, because that typically it represents years. We'll discover in Daniel chapter 7, there's going to be two and a half times, excuse me, uh, time, times, time, times, and then half a time. Time singular, times as a dual. See, we, you, we, we're familiar with singular and plurals in English. But in some languages, in Aramaic and, and Hebrew is one of them, you have, you have singular, plural, you have something in between called dual. The only place I can think of it in English, it only shows up rarely, if I said to you, I had all my friends over last night, both of them. <laughs> you laugh, of course, because you, I, I've telegraphed to you, I only have two friends. See, see it's, I said all of them, meaning plural. But I say both, it's a dual. You follow me? It's, not, it's more than one and not three, see? Well, that's, it's a ver the, the, the word times is used that way in the Aramaic. And there's a very important passage that we're going to deal with coming up where it's not in the next future sessions. Time, singular, times, dual and half a time. One plus two and a half. It's a way of saying three and a half years. There, it's very clear because it's also called 42 months. It's all co also called 1260 days. And we'll deal with that when we get there. The point is, this times is the same term. Let seven times pass over him is a way of saying in the Aramaic, seven years will pass. Okay? Are we, are we together? It's a translation issue, but I want that clear. Okay. The matter, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. I hope that's not a comment on our coming election, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> this matter is by, this is the decree. In other words, we've seen the, we've seen the vision and then these watchers or angels or whatever came down and made, made, made these announcements. Let's go back over that to be sure. Uh, the stump of roots shall be uh, in the earth, even as the band of iron and brass, uh, tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given to him, and let seven years pass, in effect. Uh, and, uh, and this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth, it, set, setteth up over it the basis of men. The point of this dream, apparently, is to make it quite clear who's really in charge. And it ain't Nebuchadnezzar. It's the God of the universe. And every one of us in this room are guilty of attacking that fact by our doubts, by our presumptions, by our ingratitude. And uh, God is in charge. He's, he's what it's all about. But that brings us to verse 17. Let's go to verse 18. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar now picks up. This has been a, his quote of what the watcher said. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation. But thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. This is Nebuchadnezzar's insight. This isn't because Daniel has some super skill. He just realized that the Spirit of God is dealing through Daniel. I think it's pretty exciting. It's also interesting that he's published throughout the known world the failure of these advisors. I suspect that's a pretty dark cloud on their resume. I don't think that's... Then, Nebuchadnezzar continues, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, he keeps saying that so that the readers in the public won't get confused because they probably don't know him by the name Daniel. They know him by his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for an hour, for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. See, Daniel understood what it was, and he didn't know how to break the news. The king spoke, the king spake and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. I love Belshazzar's remark. He said, Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee. 
and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. What Daniel is in effect saying, in effect, I wish this dream was really against your enemies, not against you. But he goes on. He doesn't pull off. He doesn't pull any punches here. Daniel continues. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, for, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown, and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. So that's phase one, to recognize that this incredible tree, provider of everything to everybody, represents Nebuchadnezzar. Because he's the guy that's strong and his greatness has grown and so forth and so on. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. In other words, apparently Nebuchadnezzar is going to be cut down, not dead, and he's going to be somehow out at night in the dew of the grass. He's going to, his portion will be with the beasts of the field for seven years. That's what this is saying. Then he says, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord the king that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of the heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, other seven years will pass, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Gutsy guy, Daniel. He's giving the king bad news. That takes a lot of character, a lot of integrity, not to, to wash this over, but to give it to him straight. And it's my belief that Nebuchadnezzar respected that. He's no dummy. He understood that this guy was giving it to him straight, not, not a sycophant telling him what he wants to hear. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. In other words, he'll be decommissioned for seven years, but he's not going to lose his kingdom. Once the lesson is learned, he's going to be okay. You see, your kingdom will be sure unto thee. After that, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. The whole point of this exercise is to let Nebuchadnezzar recognize that God is in charge. He ain't. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So spoke Daniel. Now, this idea of a tree as an idiom of, of expression is actually all through the scripture in several different ways. All through the scripture you'll find a tree is often compared to a man. In uh, several Psalms and Isaiah and Jeremiah use that expression. In fact, both the Assyrian king and the Egyptian pharaoh are compared to a cedar of Lebanon in Ezekiel 31. The olive tree is often used as an idiom of Israel in uh, the New Testament as well as the Old. A lot of passages, we don't have to beat it to death. And a, a transplanted shoot in uh, Ezekiel 17, a stump in Isaiah 11, and so on. A mustard tree is a prominent feature in Matthew 13 that most people don't understand. It's a mustard tree that becomes a monstrosity that the birds of the air, and there's a whole lesson there that if you haven't been through, you'll be surprised when you look at that in scriptural terms. But let's get back to Daniel 4. All this, this is, remember, Nebuchadnezzar is still writing here. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, and see, an incident's gonna occur a year later, where all this probably is forgotten. 
He had his dream. Daniel explained it. Okay, great, fine. Life went on for a year. At the end of 12 months, he, Nebuchadnezzar, walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And he shot his mouth off. Okay. Verse 29. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and the, for the honor of my majesty? There's a couple of things wrong with that sentence, by the way. You notice the I, the my, me. You know, this is a danger we all face. This is a danger we face, especially in places of leadership, to start taking yourself seriously. And I'm grateful. You know, I was a, I was a, I've been a chairman of the board of a, a number of public companies. I was on 12 boards. I was chairman and CEO of six of those, four of those were defense contractors. And as I look back at that career, I probably was insufferable. Because uh, everything we touched worked, and we just had, we, we, we had wild times. And, and I got my comeuppance because I got overextended and got what I deserved. There's another whole story I won't bore you with here. But the point is, as I look back, even though I was teaching Bible studies all through that period, that was my recreation. Every Monday, that's the Monday night Bible studies down in Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I taught them for, oh, 20 or 30 years. That was my recreation. I traveled a lot doing deals in my business world, but I usually home on Mondays. That's why Mondays was in the shadow of the weekend. I was, it was a, generally a safe, safe venue for me in the sense I, I wouldn't be traveling on Mondays. So that was, but even though I was teaching Bible studies, and I loved it, that was my recreation. Um, many, many people who knew me back then and know me now will quickly point out that it's quite different now. Don't misunderstand me. I'm still a work in progress uh, in many ways. But my point is, really, that it was uh, being in a position of leadership and having everything you touch work out fabulously is dangerous because the thing takes over called pride. And God had his way of dealing with my pride. I signed an $8 billion joint venture with the Soviet Union and then tried to prop when it started to stumble. I tried to prop it up myself, and I got exactly what I deserved. And I won't go through that story here. It's not relevant to this, except to point out that often it takes a fall to allow God to use us. Not that he's through yet. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to put myself in that kind of a light. I'm just saying that um, uh, it's interesting how many leaders in the scripture have to be on the backside of the desert for 40 years or whatever. In Moses' case, it's interesting to go through and study the leaders in the, in the scripture and how many of them went through a dark period as a specific training ground for being, being really called. So, anyway, the king, uh, but here, obviously, you can picture Nebuchadnezzar standing on one of the big parapets, proud of Babylon. It is not this great Babylon. It was the number one city in the world, it was considered impregnable. His grandson, Bel Belshazzar, doesn't even try to defend it when the Persians are attacking it because it was recognized by most military people at that time as being impregnable. But that's always a big mistake not to do. Anyway, well, as we'll get into next time. But it's not this great Babylon that I have built for a house of the kingdom of the strength of, uh, of the might of my power and the honor of my man. You say, gee, Chuck, you're trying to hit that hard. No, I think God hit it hard, as we'll see in a minute. Now, if you look at Babylon, it's actually a double wall. The Babylon proper was also, even beyond that, it had a great city wall that was sub very, very substantial. And uh, the, uh, if you look at just the Babylon proper, it's surrounded by a moat. The Euphrates River feeds it, as well, so it make, creates the water for the moat, as well as providing it with water in case of a siege. So it was, a, considered, it was, it was quite a place. Herodotus describes it, by the way, as being 15 miles square, a 350-foot wall, 87 feet wide. He describes it as having six chariots abreast around it. And the hanging garden, gardens of Semiramis, uh, Saddam Hussein offered prizes uh, uh, for anyone that could explain how they were irrigated, because he was trying to re replicate that and so forth. Uh, this, is built on, uh, this was where the first world dictator, Nimrod, uh, built the first part of it. And, uh, the second wall had 250 watchtowers, 100 foot higher than the wall, and uh, so on. The banquet hall in here is, uh, uh, was roughly 56 feet wide by 173 feet long, and it has been rebuilt by Saddam Hussein. We'll talk about that in subsequent sessions. But if we look at Babylon properly, there's the processional way that's there today. 
There's the Tower of Babel. The ruins are there today. Temple of Marduk and, and uh, the King's Palace that all this takes, that t Daniel, chapter 5. Takes. So we'll be getting into this in the next session because we'll talk a lot about the fall of Babylon. It's very important to both of us. But there is an interesting inscription that has been uh, found, uh, and it reads as follows. I, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, I am the son of Nabopolassar, king of Babylon. I who erected the Azita temple, I who built Procession Street, the street of the forgiven son, the street of Nebu, and paged it with shimmering stones. Nebu, you, the divine minister, grant me immortality. This is an inscription that was found in uh, cuneiforms that uh, are presently now in the museums. So the issue, of course, obviously that we're dealing with here is pride. God hates pride. And we could go through a lot of verses. I was just going to, but I think it's probably important for us to do this. Proverbs chapter 6. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. That's a very interesting rhetorical style. There's six things. No, no, there are even seven. In other words, this, this is a pattern you'll often see uh, in the Bible. There are six things the Lord doth hate. Yea, seven that are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among his brethren. Those are things that God hates. None of you, of course, are guilty of any of those, I'm sure, here, right? No, I don't need a show of hands. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not go unpunished. Proverbs, a little later in that same chapter, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Boy, that's something we read about, we acknowledge, we acknowledge intellectually, but it really is something we need to keep in front of us as we go forward. Your most dangerous time is on the heels of victory. On the heels of, that's when guys make their big mistakes, at the peak, at the bottom, at the peak. Proverbs 26, 12. Seest thou a, a man wise in his own conceit? There's more hope of, of a fool than of him. Being wise in your own conceit. Boy. Man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Boy, does the scripture full of that lesson of humility. Let God, because it puts God in control. That's where he belongs. You get to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 4. And these things, brethren, Paul says, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Boy, are there examples that we run into every day in ministry of people who are arrogant, we, we often get in discussions, we have no difference of opinion about their doctrine, but we have deep uh, 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 anxiety over the way they beat people with it. That none one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst not receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? In other words, it's a gift. You didn't do anything to earn it. God's given it to you. No reason to be proud. And yet, how easy it is for us to start taking ourselves seriously and to get where, 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 where there is contention, there is pride, the scripture says, by the way. Fulfill ye my joy. This is Philippians 2, 2 4. Fli uh, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than our, themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And Philippians goes on, that same passage goes on then to be what, what is known as the kenosis. Here's the contrast to that, and the contrast is Christ's own personal example. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not something to be grasped to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, 
and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The astonishing thing when you watch the movie like The Passion isn't just the, 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 the tremendous suffering there, but to realize who he is. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. Staggering, especially when you realize who he is. James has a lot to say about this. Go ye now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get again. Whereas ye know not what shall be on tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is what? Evil. Wow. Wow. Pride. God hates it. Why does God hate pride? Very fundamental reason, because that's what led to Satan's fall. When you study Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, those are the two major chapters on the origin of Satan, you'll discover in the Isaiah passage particularly, the five I wills that he... He says in Isaiah 14, 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, God says, this is what you've said in your heart, Satan, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Oh boy. Oh boy. God will brook no rivals. Let's get back to Daniel 4. We left there, Nebuchadnezzar is on his balcony or whatever, admiring Babylon and an ecstatic display of pride, he gets himself in trouble. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. And this is, by the way, this isn't a rumor. This is Nebuchadnezzar's written testimony to the world. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. Oh boy. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. That's the lesson that the dream talked about a year ago that he'd forgotten, and now he's going to learn it the hard way. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Can you get a picture? Here's the quaint King James language. It, you know, you don't, it's as descriptive as you want it, right? You don't want to know any more than that. <laughs> Scholars believe, from what we know here, that this is a form of lycanthropy. And uh, this is, it comes from the word lycos in Greek, which means wolf, and anthropos man, wolf man. And you could say werewolves are a medieval legend from the same kind of thing, if, you, if I can. This is stimulated in some respects by the widespread superstition of a supernatural condition in which men actually assume the physical form of werewolves or some other animal. And uh, psychic disorders and superstitions are obviously commingled in all the ancient records. And uh, they all this was linked with belief in guardian spirits, vampires, uh, uh, witches, werewolves, all that sort of stuff in the medieval period, folklore, fairy tales, and so forth. Uh, many, many people show evidence of a lycanthropic belief, whether that was a psychiatric thing or whether it was an actual disease in some cases is impossible to discern. Now, the, uh, it's a mental disorder in which the patient believes he's a wolf or some other animal. It's a mental disorder. And uh, um, the Romans uh, uh, called anyone who was supposed to have been turned into a wolf by magic, magic spells or whatever uh, called uh, versepolis, which is, means uh, turn skin. And this was widely believed in Europe in the Middle Ages. Most of this information, by the way, I got out of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So you can check those things out yourself. There's a variation of this called boanthropy, where it's not a wolf, it's an ox. And that seems to describe more the Nebuchadnezzar version of this thing. But in any case, there are other there are examples of this. 
268 B.C., Abinanus, a Greek historian, um, records a case where there was aspects of a Nebuchadnezzar's insanity being uh, on the roof and all other details. Eusebius writes about this in, in the, his letters. And uh, Josephus also talks about Barossus, a Babylonian historian, a Chaldean priest at the time of Alexander that was stricken with something like this. In 1946, in a British mental institution, there was a 20-year-old guy that was hospitalized for five years with descriptions, uh, in his case, very similar to the case that's described in Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. So there are, rather rare, fortunately, but there are records of this. In any case, Nebuchadnezzar continues, at the end of the days, in other words, after seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Wow, that's quite a statement, Nebuchadnezzar. And, uh, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he, he, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? <laughs> At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors, my Lord, sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom. And excellent majesty was added unto me. By the way, according to the Babylonian Talmud, the guy that took care of Nebuchadnezzar for those seven years of what I'll call convalescence is guess who? Daniel. I personally, from my reading of the, of the scripture, come to the conclusion that Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar bonded very early. That young king that Daniel interpreted that first dream in Daniel 2, I think he not only promoted him, I think they became very special very, very special relationship. I won't call it intimate necessarily because he's still king and Daniel's but a, you know, a, a, a servant slave. But I think Daniel was almost like his prime minister. And uh, it's clear from, from the delicate way that he exchanges with Daniel, especially in chapter 4. I think they were very, very close. And that's when I, so when the Talmud takes that position, it, it, it's consistent in my mind with all the rest, all the other evidences that they, Daniel had a very special place in his heart for Nebuchadnezzar, and that's going to come up next chapter, because we're going to go ahead now. Nebuchadnezzar passed, it will pass away. His grandson will be in charge. We'll talk about the handwriting on the wall, and they call Daniel in to interpret. And he, before he interprets it, he gives a little speech <laughs> that you'll enjoy for a lot of reasons. Um, but uh, it's clear that, he, you know, he, he, before he takes this young kid that can't figure out what's going on, he says, before I answer your question, let me tell you about your grandfather. He was a king. There was a king, not you, Squirt. That was sort of his, the flavor of his talk. Uh, he, it's a great scene. We'll see. Daniel's full of these great scenes. But anyway, so now he finishes up. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. So this is a statutory edict published throughout the world. It was issued in 562 B.C., the year that he recovered from his insanity. Um, it's the last we hear of Nebuchadnezzar. After he's restored, he lived about another year. And uh, his death was followed by a steady weakening of the empire. And we'll talk about that next time. His son, Evil Merodach, uh, takes his, takes the, succeeds him as a ruling thing. Um, but there's an interesting thing that was found in Cave 4 at Qumran. It's called the Prayer of Nabonidus, but I think when you see the details, you'll agree with me that there's a misunderstanding. The prayer is not of Nabonidus, it's of Nebuchadnezzar. Let's read what it says. The words of the prayer that I believe it, it says Nabonidus, but I think it's Nebuchadnezzar. There's only four letters and one letter difference makes the two. And it's, it's, you know, I think there's a mistake. The king of, apparently Assyrian Babylon, the king prayed, that is when he was smitten, with a malignant disease by the decree of the most high God in the city of Tima. I was smitten for seven years and from men. I was put away. When, but when I confessed my sins and my faults, he, God, 
allowed me to have a soothsayer. This was a Jewish man of the exiles in Babylon. He uh, explained it and wrote to me to render honor and great glory to the name of the Most High God. This is called the prayer of Nabonidus, but what's interesting, there are five Aramaic words that are common to chapter 4 and to this prayer. The word pitgan, which means decree or derision. Gazraya, which means soothsayer or diviner. The RBNY uh, consonants in K4, they interpret as Nabonidus. The NBND thing is confused with NBKD, which would be Nebuchadnezzar. So one letter makes the difference. And from the context of it, it so fits chapter 4, I suspect that the, so, the famous prayer of Nabonidus is actually misunderstood as the prayer of Nebuchadnezzar. I think that's kind of fun. Now let's talk about this summary. Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. Great tree honed down for seven years. Daniel interprets, just like chapter 2. A year later, he's stricken with mental derangement for seven years, and Daniel was his personal nurse. And then he recovers and publishes his testimony throughout the entire world. So what's the application of all this? You always have to say, okay, that's interesting, Chuck. How does it affect me? Well, obviously, the, the, the immediate application is Nebuchadnezzar and learning about pride. We, that, that leaves out as you're pretty straightforward. But there may be some scholars, this is a little suggestive, speculative, but I'll share it with you, think there's a prophetic parallel possible here. The ecumenical outreach of Babylonianism, the Gentile power in the last days, and final and ultimately overthrown. Seven years of insanity and confusion. A conversion that took place after the seven years of madness. And the tree that did not sprout again until after it had been cut down. And so there's people that from that kind of structure, try to draw parallels to the end time scenario. I wouldn't push it too hard, but I share it with you so you at least can be thinking about it. But it's interesting, by the way, as you think about those times, in Acts 15, you remember there's this famous Council of Jerusalem where they're all arguing about does a Gentile have to become a Jew to be saved? The, the Jewish, early Jewish church, when Gentiles joined, the way you joined Judaism was to become a Jew, a pro, what they call a proselyte. But with the church growing, both Peter and Paul are having incredible results where that, uh, and, and there's big arguments about it. So they go back to Jerusalem to have this out. What does a Gentile have to do? Does he have to become Jewish to be a Christian? And there's obviously the Judaizers are really strong on that. And they still are today, by the way. Be careful of those. It's wonderful to get into these messianic fellowships and, and enjoy what's there. But be careful you don't become uh, under the spell of a Judaizer because that's part of what Christ freed us from. But anyway... James is uh, the, uh, the, the ostensible leader of this group, and he resolves this. What most people deal with there is the primary issue is, does a, what, is a, a Jew, what does a Gentile have to do to become a Jew Christian? That's one of two questions. There's a second question not explicit in chapter F Acts 15, but if you see the context, you realize that the other question is, okay, if he doesn't have to become a Jew, what's to become of Israel? If a Gentile becomes saved without becoming a Jew, what's it all been for for us? I mean, where, where do we fit in? That, you know, there's another issue here. Is God through with us? And many churches teach that, which is not true. It's a, that's, that's part of what is being dealt with here by James. James there in Acts 15, starting about verse 14, will quote from Amos to, res, to respond to all these things. Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree... The words of the prophets as it is written, and here he's quoting from James, Amos 9, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Let's take a look at, uh, notice this, I'll take, first you're going to take a name of people, people out of his name. That's the church. Okay. After this, I will return to build again, and so forth. In Amos 9, Amos writes, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and will build it again, uh, build it as in the days of old, and that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this, and so on. And all this is covered, by the way, in our briefing called the Next Holocaust, and the refuge in Edom. The whole role of Israel in the final climax of the tri tribulation and all of that stuff. In Hosea chapter 5, Jesus 
says something very strange through Jose. He says, I will go and return to my place. He must have left it in order to return. I will go to and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. So that's what the Great Tribulation is all about. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, dies after a year, and Emil Marduk, or Evil Marduk, he's sometimes recorded, ruled only two years. And 2 Kings 25, Jeremiah 52 deals with that. He's uh, uh, succeeded by Nergalizer. He's the son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar, mar married one of his daughters. And he's mentioned in, in Jeremiah 39. And then when he uh, uh, gets killed or murdered, whatever, uh, Labesh Marduk uh, lasted only nine months. And he's, su he's succeeded by Nabonidus. Now Nabonidus is just not interested in being king. He actually spends most of his time in northern Arabia on other intrigues. He's not interested in really running things from the palace. He leaves it to his son, Belshazzar, as sort of a co-regent. And Belshazzar is in charge when the Persians attack. Nabonidus is elsewhere. And uh, uh, many, for many, many, many years, up until relatively recent decades, the secular authorities made fun of the Bible because they all know that Nabonidus was king, not Belshazzar. And the Bible all has Belshazzar. Well, relatively recent discoveries reveal this whole situation. The Nabonidus wasn't there. His, co his son his, was co-regent. And what's interesting about all that, those discoveries vindicate the book of Daniel. In fact, make it pretty clear that Daniel had to be an eyewitness. Very different than the secular history he had uh, known for centuries. So, Now the kings, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was of course king until, uh, and his son Nebuchadnezzar was general and becomes king, of course, in 605. And he has two sons and two daughters. Evil Merodach succeeds him when he dies. He has another daughter that got married. We're not sure of the details there. Nereglisser is his other son. Um, his other daughter marries Nabonidus. Nereglisser, when he passes away, his son ruled for a couple of months. And it's a very turbulent uh, palace. People getting murdered and whatever. But Nabonidus is not interested. He's away. Belshazzar is actually the acting co-regent. And that'll be in, that sets us up for chapter 5. Now, in your next session... You obviously, I want you to read yourselves in preparation next time, uh, Daniel chapter 5, which is a very, very readable chapter. But uh, don't confuse the fall of Babylon that it describes, which happened in 539 BC, with the doom of Babylon that is prophesied in the Bible in Isaiah 13 and 14, and Jeremiah 15 and 51, and also in Revelation 17 and 18. And one of the things I'm going to ask you to do. As, as preparation for not only next time, but the time after that, for the next two sessions. I want you to read those, in addition to chapter 5, I want you to read these six chapters, three pairs of them. Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 15 and 51, and Revelation 17 and 18. They're each as a pair. Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50 and 51, and Revelation 17 and 18. What I want you to do is mark those six chapters down someplace conveniently, and what I'd like you to do is read all six in one sitting. Find a time when you've got maybe 40 minutes, somewhere between a half an hour and an hour, uh, and, and, and read those six chapters at one sitting. That's important. Don't try to master it. Just read them. But read them all together because what I want you to have a, the personal experience of putting those six together. You're going to see, I think, that they all are talking about the same thing by the use of language, by the way they go at it. Um, Jeremiah is a little more wordy than the others, but the point is uh, there's lots of scholastic debates about that, but all you need to do is sit down and read those six chapters yourself and come to your own feeling for that text. And we'll talk about that next time. And, and read these six chapters at one sitting for the next two sessions. That background will help you not just for next, the next session, but the one after that too, because we're going to take the next session, we're going to take chapter five and go through what happened historically. And then chapter, the session after that, while it's all fresh in your mind, I thought we'd just tackle the issue of Babylon in prophecy in the future. Because you and I are witnessing day to day some absolutely provocative events in Iraq, and specifically 55 miles to the south. It's going to resolve debates that have been argued about among scholars for centuries. But I think you're going to discover that Babylon is going to reemerge as a major uh, element on our strategic horizon once again. And as it does, I want you really equipped for that. So we're going to do not just with chapter 5 of Daniel, we'll deal with these 
uh, six in the, in, the, in the subsequent sessions. So we'll have two sessions. Um, we have room because we're going to do Dan the 12 chapters of Daniel in 24 sessions. Excuse me, excuse me, in 16 sessions. So we've got four extra, you know, um, uh, extra credit sessions. So we'll take one of them on Babylon, and we'll take another one when we talk about the lion's den to talk about some surprises you can use when you get to Christmas season. And we'll be on about the right timing. That'll work out pretty good. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer.